Okay, welcome back to America at Agenda. You just heard National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications, John Kirby, say that the Biden administration is not looking for a war with Iran. This after a deadly drone strike in Jordan killed three of our American soldiers. Okay, 2024 presidential candidate Nikki Haley says the Biden administration's weak stance on Iran is what led to these attacks. And to discuss this and more, we welcome the former governor of South Carolina, former ambassador to the UN, and candidate for president of the United States, Nikki Haley. Ambassador, thanks so much for joining us here in studio. Thank it's you It's an for honor me. to speak with you. Let's dive into what happened over the weekend. You already said that the United States should retaliate swiftly in the way that only America can do. If you were commander in chief right now, what would you do be doing? With so first Iran? of all, it's yeah. not that we hit Iran hard. It's that we hit Iran smart. There's two totally different things. This doesn't mean you just go bomb Iran. What it does mean is the one thing Biden did was lift the sanctions. It sent all of that money into the proxies that allowed them to get the missiles and all the ammunition they needed to hurt our soldiers. Put the sanctions back on, first thing. Second thing is go and look at the production sites where those missiles are coming from. Take those out in Iraq and Syria. Thirdly, go after the IRGC members that are making these decisions. It's strategic. It's not that you just go bomb a country. You go and you take out one or two of those leaders, it will leave them flat-footed. That's the way you deal with Iran. Ambassador, should this have ever happened? I know no. that's kind of a general statement, but the way and following this along, this didn't need to happen. What, what's going on It's over there? what's infuriating. I'm the wife of a combat veteran. He's deployed right now. The one thing a military family wants to know is that America will have their back. Biden didn't do that. 160 strikes in Iraq and Syria, dozens injured. You see two Navy SEALs murdered. Then you see these three soldiers that were murdered. That shouldn't have happened. It started with Afghanistan. It went on further with Ukraine. It went on further with how they dealt with Iran, with Israel. And now you see what's happening in the Red Sea. Biden has been scared of his own shadow from the very beginning. And because he didn't do anything to prevent war, we are actually on the verge of one, and we have to stop that from happening. Yeah, I, I want to talk about the U.N., of course, your former U.N. ambassador. We know that a lot of senior U.N. officials are very negative when they speak about Israel, and they seem to support Hamas and Palestinians instead. We're also just learning about UNRWA, of course, those 12 members accused of actually helping Hamas attack Israel. What do you think should be done? Are you surprised to hear this? Should we have anticipated this in advance? Not surprised at all. It is why when I was at the United Nations, I cut off all U.S. aid going to UNRWA because we saw in the schools, the textbooks, they were spreading terrorist conversations. I mean, it would say, if you have five Israeli soldiers and you kill three Israeli soldiers, how many Israeli soldiers do you have left? That's what the textbooks were. We knew that the people working in UNRWA in UNRWA were helping all of the terrorists. Pro I mean, you could see it. And so we stopped all U.S. aid going. The world condemned us over it. I said, well, if the Arab countries care so much, they can pay for it. Why does the U.S. have to pay for it? And look at what happened. This is absolutely no surprise. Biden went and started giving money back to UNRWA, and he can sit there and say he actually was part of the problem as to why this happened to Israel in the first place. Let's bring things domestically here at home. Let's talk about the border. As it stands right now, about 300,000 people cross the border each month. It's, it's completely out of control. You've said you would build a wall, but you would do more than that. You want to do more. So expand on that. What's that look like? Are you, are you talking deportations? Go ahead. So when I was governor, we passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. We'll do what we did in South Carolina, and we'll go national. We'll do a national e-verify program where every business has to prove that the people they hire are here legally. Defund sanctuary cities once and for all. Make sure we put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. Go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, you go to catch and deport. There are no excuses why this hasn't been done. Republicans and Democrats need to get in a room and not come out until they have a solution to this. Another issue that a lot of uh, electors are talking about, especially Republicans, they can't seem to agree on abortion. 
whether it should be with the states, whether it should be with the Supreme Court. You have said that you are very pro-life, but you have also said that an abortion should be a woman's decision. Where do you stand on abortion? And again, if you were elected, what would you do with this issue? So unapologetically pro-life, not because the Republican Party tells me to be, but because my husband was adopted. I had trouble having both of my children, so I am blessed um, all the way around. I think that the right thing was when unelected justices said it should not be with the Supreme Court, it should be in the hands of the people. And now every state's decided that's the right thing. When it comes to the federal law, though, we have to be honest with the American people. The only way something will pass is if you have a majority of the House, 60 Senate votes, and a signature of a president. We haven't had 60 Republican senators in over 100 years. We might have 45. So the only way we're going to get anything done is through consensus. So let's start by saying we're going to ban late-term abortions. Let's encourage adoptions. Let's say any doctor or nurse who doesn't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform it. Let's make sure contraception is accessible. And let's make sure no state law says to a woman if she gets an abortion that she's going to jail or she's getting the death penalty. Start there. Stop demonizing this issue. Our goal should be how do we save as many babies as possible and support as many moms as possible. Nikki. Uh, I want to get to this question here as for the race for the Republican nomination against the former president coming up in less than just months. It's the primary in your home state. OK, you are down in the current polls. You've talked about this, though. You're aware of that. That doesn't mean you're, you're saying it doesn't mean your campaign stops if you don't win South Carolina. Elaborate for us on that. What are you trying to accomplish down there? The goal is to continue to grow. We started with 2 percent in Iowa. We got rid of the fellas. It's just me and Trump in the end. So we went to 20 percent in Iowa. We got 43 percent in New Hampshire. And now in South Carolina, we want to be stronger than that. I think you have to go and look at the fact that delegates, you have to have 1,215. Trump has 32. I have 17. This is still very much a race. So no matter what anyone is saying, we have got to go and keep this going. 48 states and territories still need to vote. But more than that, let's speak some hard truths. If Donald Trump becomes the Republican nominee, we will get a President Kamala Harris. You mark my words. Mm -hmm. He cannot win a general election. Look at Iowa. Look at New Hampshire. He can't get independence. He can't get suburban women. He's losing Republicans who say they don't want him and will vote for someone else. It's a problem. This is not personal for me. I have no problems with Donald Trump. I voted for him twice. I was proud to serve in his administration. This is about the fact America can't lose again. We lost in 2018. We lost in 2020. We lost in 2022. How many more times do we have to lose before we realize we have got to right this ship? And, you know, let's continue the Donald Trump conversation, of course. Many saying, why doesn't Nikki Haley drop out? She's hurting the Republican Party. She's hurting our best chance to get Biden out of the White House. Mm. What do you say to those people? Who's saying it? It's Trump mm. and the political elite. That's it. I've never been part of the political elite. I don't want to be a part of the political elite. The people who are saying that are the congressional members around him, the Lindsey Grahams of the world, and everybody who's got nothing done on cutting wasteful spending, nothing done on the border, nothing done on preventing war. They've done nothing. And so Donald Trump has surrounded himself once again by people who have done nothing and will do nothing. What I'm saying is it's time to start listening to the American people. 75% of Americans have said they don't want a Trump-Biden rematch. The majority of Americans both say they disapprove of Trump and Biden. Biden. We are $8 trillion in debt more just in four years because of Trump. He needs to start answering. It's why I've said he's got to get on a debate stage. Answer the question about why you put us that much in debt. Answer the question on why you now want to raise taxes on all Americans by putting a 10% tariff. That's anything from baby strollers to appliances. You've got to answer that. Answer why you went and praised China's President Xi a dozen times after China gave us COVID. There are too many questions for him not to get on a debate stage and answer. Do you think he will? I mean, you look, I don't, I've never known him to be fearful of anything, but now I'm starting to think he's fearful because he has not done that yet. And at the end of the day, if you're fighting for the American people, prove it. Because what he did was he threw a temper tantrum on stage the night of the New Hampshire election. He's done a rant ever since, but he hasn't once talked about the American people. He's not talking about anything that's going to help the American people. He's just talking about himself. We can't go into four years like that. We won't survive it. Ambassador, I, I love bringing up this question whenever we have presidential uh, hopefuls <laughs> on. 
I'm from Western Pennsylvania, part of the Rust Belt. Grew up in a little town that has been hit, decimated actually, by loss of manufacturing. There's thousands of towns like this all across the Rust Belt, all across the country, really. A lot of these people feel like they've been forgotten. People in inner cities, just the same, feel like they've been forgotten. Nothing good has come their way in a long time. What's your message to them? How can you right that ship? How can you bring new industry into town, so to speak? What do you think? It's not what I say, it's what I've done. I'm from a rural southern town in South Carolina, and when I became governor, South Carolina had lost all our jobs to the textile industry that went overseas. By the time I left, we were number one in foreign direct investment. We were number one in manufacturing. We were known as the beast of the Southeast. We were building planes with Boeing, more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies. And not only that, we didn't bring people to work in those jobs. We trained South Carolinians to do those jobs. That's, That's the key. It's That's the job the key. Training, the training, giving them the skills to learn how to do this kind of stuff. You yes. want people to get reskilled to do these exactly. jobs, not move yeah. people around. That's important. That's a great point. And last question before we let you go. I wish I could talk to you for the, our full two hours. <laughs> uh, but we, we all know our country is more divided than it ever has been before. To what do you attribute that or to whom do you attribute that? And what will you do if you are president to heal America? The tone at the top matters. We see it with Joe Biden. We saw it with Donald Trump. Think about it. When did all this start? It actually started with Obama, and it kind of just, it just kept going up more and more. Politics should not be personal. It is not personal. It's more about national security. It's about creating better lives for our children. Right now, you've got two fellas that are involved in investigations that both want to be president, that are busy talking about themselves. That is why our kids in our 20s are very worried about the direction in our country, because that's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is, will they ever afford a home? Will they ever be able to see this country's debt go down? Will they be able to get a job? We've got to stop talking about the personalities and talk about the strength of our country, because you know who's watching this distraction right now and enjoying every minute of it? Russia, China, and Iran. It's time for us to get back on track. So join NikkiHaley.com, and let's get this moving. Okay, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yes. Former ambassador <laughs> to the U.N., Nikki Haley. Thanks former so governor much. of South Carolina. Appreciate it. God bless you. Really Best appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador.